Okay, so today I want to um, do a little bit about layouts. I want to start off on different kinds of layouts that you can do for your recipes and generally how to go about making an illustrated layout. Um, in the past, what I've seen, because uh, in the beginning, all you can think of is the recipe, you don't really land up thinking about how presentable the recipe is going to look. These are things that you, uh, if someone has some exposure to either journalism or graphic design, even photography to some extent, you you think of these external elements. But otherwise, there's no reason to. So today I'm going to bring out some of the hidden elements of layouts which can make your illustration look compelling. Uh, we'll begin first with just planning a layout, what all that entails. And from there, we will go to things like backdrops, uh, borders, how to create frames, and then also a little bit on brush lettering. Since we are doing illustrated recipes, one of the easiest styles of making lettering is through brush lettering. And um, I think, so, I have a feeling, a lot of times people are intimidated with brush lettering, thinking that there is some technique to it. There is a very small technique that you can employ and start doing brush lettering quite easily. So hopefully I will be able to show you that. Okay, so here are the different elements that you need to think about when you are doing layouts. A layout is necessarily only how a page looks. Often when your page is uh, in a magazine or a book, you have to contend with a layout accommodating two surfaces. So it's important to see or visualize the end result of the layout. What are the different uh, elements that go in. So one is, in as far as our recipes are concerned, it's the text of the recipe itself. Second, obviously, the illustration. But now in this, you can divide this further and you can say, okay, you have a title and body. And sometimes you might also have additional text that is um, sub uh, subtitles or minor text or instructions. So that will be a third one. So these would be, um, oh, I, I keep forgetting the name. Let's say taglines. And I'll, I'll come to what it means. Then in the illustration, there are different types of ways that we can illustrate. Um, so you can have, which obviously, which we are going to go into. Uh, now let's first talk about the text of the recipe. Never start without first writing the recipe. Now, either you write the recipe on your laptop or um, on your iPad, somewhere write the recipe in full. So you will write ingredients, method, 
special processes like if you want to explain a certain process then those things so these are all headers whatever is um applicable to your recipe you just fill in that part mm -hmm. and you have any special instructions now sometimes you will also have some narration or a story to the recipe and these are, are what make your recipe more personal this is this is what makes it a little different from just another recipe book there could be a memory very often there could be a significant story by but difference between memory and story is the story could be very generic like for example i remember in alka's book there is something called um railway railway chicken or railway mutton or something like that so where does that word come from why is it called railway something so that can be a story that you can investigate add it as part of your recipe so this is as far as the text of the recipe is concerned the second part is illustrate all elements in rough so now the illustrations can have objects even actions and sometimes <clears throat> it can have <coughs> extra stuff or unrelated stuff uh, we will just call that embellishments like for example if you are writing about railway chicken that's part of your narration the embellishment can be something related to the story rather than just the recipe so if it is uh, such that um, or like for example the story there is a story behind biryani so the invention of biryani and as far as i know it was meant to be something to be carried on a on a long journey on the back of a camel or something like that very weird but then that for that recipe then i could easily draw a camel with a biryani pot on its back or something like that that has nothing to do with the recipe or any of these objects or actions that becomes an embellishment for the recipe so these headers will help you create a much more rounded recipe uh, or visualize the process of making the recipe illustration now by any means this is not the end or the final list depending upon your own imagination you can add any more elements to this also so let's come back to the illustration bit this is fairly finite for the illustration bit i want to elaborate a little bit So step one, after you have written the recipe, is to make rough thumbnails. A rough thumbnail is nothing but just drawing, say if I want to make a salad or something, I want to make a root salad. So I'll draw... a potato a sweet potato a carrot a yam so on and so forth so this is a thumbnail illustration it's no bigger than maybe uh, an inch or like a postage stamp size <clears throat> from here you can go on to practicing these illustrations in isolation now till you become comfortable with illustration 
it is good to just, for example, bring out a potato and try out options. So the options are in shapes, mediums. and colors. So should I make this in pen? Should I make this in uh, pencil and then watercolor it? Should I make it in color pencil or crayon? All these things are the trials for the isolated images. So what, what does this look like? Versus if I were to make a watercolor. Now this is also all trials. In this, you will be able to visualize how you want to present these. So you can think about whether you want to show them as cut pieces or whole. All of these can be worked out. That's what the shapes means. And now with colors, it can be as simple as what treatment you want to give your um, your illustration. Like for example, if I want to draw a sweet potato, can I make the sweet potato slightly blue and then insert a little bit of crimson into that? What kind of effect do I get? When we do this beforehand, we know what to expect. And you can steer clear from potential problems. I know this all sounds too, too much work, but trust me, this will, this is like oiling the gears so that when your machinery is working, you don't have to then keep breaking and then be uh, lost without a map. Once this is finally done, after this, you move to layouts. Plan layouts. Now, the reason why we move to this is because you get to you get to see quite a few things over here. One is you get to see the volume of all elements. So you know whether you're gonna put one sweet potato, two sweet potatoes, or how many elements in the ingredients you're gonna put. You also get to see the variety. of elements. Now sometimes, like for example, baking bread, the ingredients are very few, but the processes are many. So that means that the elements are different. Some, once you'll show a bowl, then you'll show a scraper, you'll show a whisk, then you'll show a jug full of water or milk or all sorts of stuff. So there is a huge range of tools that you can illustrate. Whereas the bread itself is just flour and water and yeast and that's about it. So here you can see how many different elements you have, what is the variety, and then you can decide on how to plan the layout. Then you also know the length of your recipe. So sometimes when you have a salad, you just say, okay, chop everything, boil everything or whatever, put it in and this is the dressing. 
So you don't have a very long, elaborate recipe. And then conversely, if you have uh, some elaborate curry where you marinate the meat and keep it aside, then you grind one kind of spices, another kind of uh, spices, then mix them, then whatever, saute them, then leave them, then grind them. There's such a long process to all of that. So that length of recipe also you get to know once you have written the text in full. So, uh, yeah, then you have the number of total elements. Now, even in this, we will measure individual elements by counting them literally and text with how many lines of text we more or less will have. With all this, now we can build the layout. So let's try a few options here. Let's start with a simple layout idea. I always gravitate to salads for simple because you know that the instructions are very few. Method is hardly anything. It's just a toss. Hardly any special processes. All of that is very little. And generally, the objects are very beautiful. So you have uh, very nice... Uh, vegetables and everything is green and looks very delicious. So a simple thing, simple layout would be just to distribute all the elements in this space, put a bowl over there and just say cut and toss. So that's also fine. You don't have to make it too, uh, too fancy. But if you're, if you're, going to make the recipe of say tossed salad. You can play with the word tossed. So you could have things like don't have your bowl flat. Keep it in mo motion. Almost as if you are tossing the salad from there. And then when you are distributing the ingredients, distribute them in some kind of order. And this is pretty much general for a lot of other design. So identify similar colors. Similar size similar texture. This is just to identify and decide on that order. So you could either have similar colors together so it looks more harmonious or you could deliberately change and put the colors all over the place uh, so that it looks more jhatak. So for example, if we've got, you've got lettuce, And then you've got beans, but I don't want to put the two together. So I'll put lettuce and beans on opposite side. And right in the middle of that, I'll put tomato or something. So you have green, red or light green, red, dark green. Then I could probably have carrot or something. So I could... I could show a whole carrot and then I could show it diced. Now, here is nuance. Obviously, you're not going to put a whole carrot in a salad. So, please allow your viewers to have a little intelligence. Anyone who puts a whole lettuce or a whole carrot or a whole tomato doesn't deserve to eat a salad. So, when you're drawing this, you can always draw this so that 
at least the ingredients are recognizable. When you chop stuff up, when you see it in a photograph, you can recognize it. But an illustration, sometimes it becomes difficult. So you can do this. I can make a potato, but I'll show pieces. So you, you have covered two parts in this. You have shown the ingredients and you've also spoken a little bit about method or special uh, instructions, how to cut them up. Then we can move on to maybe pineapple or something. And then you can show the pineapple cut up like that. So here we have, uh, these are the following colors. We have yellow. We have orange. Let's do my greens. You have a light green. Red. And a slightly deeper green for the beans. This exercise, I would say, is very important. You may do it in uh, color pencil if you want. You may do it in watercolor, whatever you want to do it. But please engage in this exercise because now you can start seeing the recipe come together. When you are thinking about what to do on a bowl, it's all a matter of balance. Sometimes your ingredients are boring then you make the bowl interesting. If your ingredients are interesting, you can get away with a plain bowl. So you could probably just make a blue colored bowl or something, just so that it stands out. And then you could write tossed salad. And we'll come to the lettering in a bit. The second one, slightly, uh, I would say, intermediate or a little more complex. And I'm just going to put complexer over here because a little more complex is very large, uh, a statement to put there. Now here you could make a complex um, illustration if you are making a recipe that requires maybe special processes or special uh, tools. So for example, you need grinding, you need mixing or power boiling and all of that put together. Maybe the focus can be on those elements also. So what you need to draw other than just these are Things like a mortar and pestle. And then you can draw some, a whole array of spices around it. Now, the reason why this becomes complex is for something like that, you need to think about how you're going to put the text. And are you going to put the text on the same page as, over, as we did for the toss salad? So there could be a chance that you might want to write the recipe with ingredients and method on one side. You could have, these are the ingredients, you have the special instructions. 
and then you could have the method. So you have an entire page dedicated to making the recipe. So here now you can really spend time on making all sorts of ingredients, all sorts of sorry tools. Now, in order to be comfortable with this, you should first practice drawing the objects. Just like this, in the isolated images, try drawing walks, kadhais, spoons. It takes a little while to get a sense of proportion, get the right sizes, things like drawing a gas. Never do something like that as on your final page without at least trying it uh, three, four times before. And then you can have your final dish laid out. And you can also put it on nice trivet. What else? Yeah, you can put some accompaniments with that. And you can write some, the name over here or somewhere. Uh, of course, these are just the spices. So the additional ingredients can come over here. Now, as you can see, there's so much happening over here. This is something that you need more time with or you can be clever about it. You could put a different color backdrop for the spices. And instantly you'll see how everything gets broken up now. You have the A color for mixing of the spices as a backdrop against which then you have just the recipe made against the white backdrop. And then, of course, you have the final food. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So now let's get on to backdrops. Uh, obviously, what I'm giving you is just an overview of layouts. All these can change. A lot of things can go up and down all over the place. And we have done one lesson in uh, layouts some time ago. I'm, I'll share a recording, the link to that recording later. So you could go through that as well. Now let's come to the problem of backdrops. Backdrops or background color, texture, whatever, this needs to be planned ahead. Backdrops cannot be an afterthought.
And unfortunately, that is the case in most places. That after the whole illustration is done, you feel, I wish I had a backdrop. The only condition in which you can have a backdrop afterwards is when the backdrop is dark. So light colored backdrops first dark colored backdrops last. <clears throat> the backdrop can be um, can be colors, textures, prints, prints or weaves, and also uh, extra stuff like, uh, like for example, you can have uh, just like a collage or cutouts of your foods against real items like cloth. You don't even have to draw those. Mm. Real objects. So the different types of backdrops. One simple and basic one is having washes. The next one is having a watermark. And the last one is special effects. These are only three that I'm showing you and there are several topics that can fit into this. So wash is, a, is nothing but a wash. So you can take whatever color or colors you want and make a backdrop. So for example, I want to show a picnic. I can easily create a nice backdrop of a blue sky No, this would be a watermark, sorry. So I could just make a wash of a blue sky and bring it down into something green, perhaps. So this is just a simple wash. All it does is give me something other than white paper to write my recipe. Now, when it comes to watermarks, you can make a very light colored illustration or a print in the background. So, say you're going to the south of France or something, and they have some very typical patterns that you can pick up. You just paint them really light so that once they dry you don't you don't see too much of it and you can in fact illustrate your text right on top of this also these could be prints these could be even your uh, things like a scenery if you want Aditi, a quick question. Yeah. 
Uh, if you have color already on the paper, how would you actually color your ingredients if you have to paint them on this? You can still color them because these are going to be a very light color. It's not going to be a very dark color. And also it depends on what you are uh, making uh, as your recipe. So if your recipe has got very detailed colors or ingredients and um, you need the white of the paper, then don't make the backdrop. So backdrops right. are optional. They're not compulsory. All right. All right. Or you could have uh, a different illustration on just one part of the paper, right? As yeah. an embellishment, what you said earlier. Yeah, yeah. you could have that. Okay. You could also put the text on this while the recipe right. can be on another page. Got it, got it. So point being that if you are making a, uh, a backdrop, make it before. Don't make it afterwards. So uh, similarly to this, now special effects is uh, a slightly more advanced version of the backdrop where you will make the backdrop um, even more elaborate and maybe make the recipe so it, it becomes part of the recipe more than just making your paper look good so for example if you are going to write a recipe of um, something that is ages old you could always make a very nice uh, painting even on which you can then write your recipe so i will i can do something like Make my illustration very lightly, but in some places I can make it dark so that it looks impressive. And knowing this, I think is very important because then you can also hunt for recipes that are of that nature. Like if you are going to even write a simple recipe of, say, sandwiches, or, but they are Victorian sandwiches or something like that, then you can make a painting from that era as a backdrop to make your picture look imposing, a little more impressive. And this also brings us to framing. So here we have a little bit of backdrop, but we can also add things like um, a tree in the foreground along the edge. So this becomes background as well as frame. So what I want you to know is that first and foremost, what I'm giving you are tip of the iceberg ideas. And I want you to think beyond just these because a lot of stuff is doable and it's allowed if you just take a chance. Now, if you follow this process of making all these uh, thumbnails, and then writing all the recipes. And very important sometimes is coming up with a narrative of the recipe. You might see these visuals. Here now it's almost looking like a jungle book effect. So we could, any Indian recipe will fit inside of this. Now, moving on to framing. Frames can be of different types. And frames can sometimes be made in the beginning. Anything you make as a planned idea is better than unplanned frames. So what goes for backdrops goes for frames as well. 
don't make a frame just because you have some space or you make want to make the page look more formal. That that just doesn't work. Well, no. Why why am I saying that? Sometimes it works, huh? But you have to be sure. Okay, so most important is when do you need frames? One is you may have a lot of space. So to use up space, to give an air of formality, to add effects, to the recipe, um, sometimes you can also tie in a form or make it evocative. Like for example, if you make um, something that looks like a Mughal recipe or something, you can make a frame of a Mughal darbar that darbar really doesn't do anything for the recipe. Maybe the recipe also wasn't something that was served in the royal court. But the two together are evocative of an era. So they make sense. Remember both these, I need to write this in bold. They are optional. So don't add willy-nilly. Only if you feel your recipe can be better with that, add it. Uh, how do you know it's getting better? It should not, it should not clutter up. Colors shouldn't clash. Forms shouldn't clash. Only then do backdrops and frames make sense. If all of this is happening, then avoid. It is not necessary. Okay, let's try out some simple frames. Frames are very easy to do. One is just a nice thick color border. This is simple enough. If you have, if you think you have a lot of space on the sides, this can be done even before it can be done even after.
then you can you can make a line but when you're making a line instead of just making it straight from corner to corner think if you want to add something more so even something as simple as chamfered edges are good so it's not a lazy addition Then if we were to combine the two, but make it a little more elaborate, you could do something like that. I'm just going to show you how that elaborate thing will look. Mark out your four points. Mark the centers of those four edges. And you can do something like this. It, it could look a little to opulent, but I'm, I'm going for opulent right now. So just a gen gentle S shape so that the corners are pointing outward and on the sides, the line comes inward. Here you can make just the frame or you could also color the outside. Now how the shape of this frame is very crucial. And for this, it will help if you do a little bit of research. From age to age, use of color, lines, forms has been changing. So the kind of embellishments that were used in the previous century, you won't see them in the early part of the century, but you might see them in the latter part of the century, just as vintage. So it's very important that all these forms be respected. And the best way is just ask for Google this and you will be able to see hundreds of samples of design elements from different countries, from different uh, regions, different times of the, uh, of, uh, the century. Amanu, are you making all this or you're just uh, observing? No, I'm observing. Okay, fine. I think you will remember all of these things, no? Yes, ma'am. Good. Amanu is our chess champion. So I think he will have a good memory. I would never be able to remember any of this. So I have to make elaborate notes. Now, moving on from these slightly simplistic frames, we can make, like I was saying earlier, uh, very specific frames like uh, 
a Mughal Darbar or whatever. So for that, again, a little research will help. And you could do something as simple as just make a nice frame. A Mughal arch. But remember always to also make the frame all over. Don't just make it on the top. Study some of the original designs before you attempt this. Because they are absolutely exquisite and their best bit is they are so well planned. So you can you can really make a lovely design out of it. For example, the geometric patterns. Even if I do something as simple as making vertical, horizontal and crossways lines, I will be able to recreate the feel of a Mughal design really well. Even this would be enough, just uh, vertical and horizontal, but also maybe a little diagonals. Okay, everyone with me? Yeah, Aditi, I'm sorry. Can you show how did you do the diagonal part? I just made a diagonal across the corners. Uh, across the corners. Yeah, so here, no? you, hmm. if you make a line from just a little inside of the shape, it goes across both edges. And then the other way around. Now there's one frame where you can create a frame from the part of the recipe also. Like, for example, if you want to make one recipe that speaks about options, like um, an fruit and veggie juices, for example, then in that case, you could make a frame of all the fruit and veggies in that sequence also. Like, for example, I could make... Uh, pineapple here and maybe sliced watermelon just because the sliced watermelon looks a little more interesting than just a green dhabba and just make all these fruits and vegetables around in a form so now this technically becomes a frame though it is also ingredients so with this, it can be very nice where if you're writing about fruit juices uh, or mixed juices, many of the ingredients are already in the frame and you don't really need to do other anything other than write four different options. 
Uh, what else you have? Mango. You can have papaya. So I'm just drawing all the fruits possible. Leafy greens. And the rules for this are like what we've done earlier. See whether you want to make a color harmony or you want to intersperse a few things here or there so that the colors are a little less predictable. That is up to you. Now, once you've made a frame like that, if the pictures are um, drawn well, you might get away with not making this in color and making the in inside part in color. So here again, it's a combination of backdrop and frame, pretty much like the special effect. Now, when you do something like that, the frame gets its due attention, but the focus then comes to where the color is. And you can also make a wash, which is dark to light or light to dark. That also looks very impressive. Okay, I'm going to give you a few minutes to finish this up. Now, the last one that I can show you is where you can make a pattern, maybe like a print or something. But because you want your recipe to be visible, you can make a slightly amorphous shape in the center. And then you can make a pattern around it. So let's try making a pattern with uh, a tartan. So these patterns are also so, again, evocative.
they instantly remind you of a picnic maybe or similar event or at least the food that they're speaking about. With a print like that, you would, I don't think you would think about um, something like a masala dosa or an idli. You will definitely think of something else. And this part now, you can keep it painted like that, as if the design itself is breaking up. It's as if we have erased part of the design in the center, so you can write your recipe there. This is very reminiscent of Good Housekeeping, from the 70s and 80s where they would superimpose a pattern or picture of a recipe or even text. Okay, does this give you some ideas? Uh, yes, a lot more clarity, yeah, about how to go about it. Very good, very good. So I'm just going to write a few more ideas over here for frames. Like we have this, uh, this would now, I guess, be gingham. You could also make something like uh, wooden planks. You could make plants also, uh, maybe a vine running through or something like that. Um, then you could make, uh, what else is there? You could make even tools. Any kind of object can be converted into a frame. So this one, the one in the bottom middle, instead of fruit and vegetables, if you want to show a working lunch, for example, all these elements could easily be converted into an outdoor work process. Like uh, maybe you're a photographer or maybe you're uh, 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 maybe or a surveyor or something, an explorer, you could always draw those elements around and then write a recipe for that. All right, now let's move to the brush lettering. I'm gonna give you a few brush lettering tips. I'm just one moment, I'll be right back. Okay. So for, for this exercise, use a medium brush, like a four or a five. And uh, normally if we write holding the brush upright, we get very odd lines. So I want you to try holding the brush perpendicular to the stroke you're making. Whatever stroke you're make, making, keep the brush perpendicular to that stroke, not to the edge of the brush. So say, for example, I'm making the letter A. The stroke on the left is going from northeast to southwest. So my brush will be pointing towards the northwest like that. Okay, this is the stroke. My brush will be pointing over here. If this is the stroke, 
my brush will be pointing here. Then keep, uh, this is one point. Uh, don't overload the brush. Just keep it well hydrated so you get good short strokes. Amanyu, you could practice this. Don't just observe this. This you can try writing because yes. then you can ask me questions if you aren't getting some strokes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what's going to happen is when we start writing, a little part of our brush is going to be flattened and we can consistently get one thickness of line and this will make our letters look like they belong to the same family keep moving your hand from one direction to the other when you're making circular letters, break up the strokes. Brush strokes work best when moving from left to right and top to bottom rather than the other way around unless you move your hand. The shapes are going to be a little wonky. So please keep them wonky. Don't try to make them too precise or perfect like printed letters. Otherwise, you're missing the point. And load the brush before it goes completely dry. So here I'm going to write a few arrows so you can remember how the strokes were done. For circular letters especially, it can be a little bit of a challenge. Even letters like these, like H, make the two parallel lines first. One and two, and then the horizontal line. That way you can ensure that these two are parallel. The same thing goes for Z as well. One, 
two, and then you make three. Even for n, you can do the same. One, two, three. But it, it's all in the effort to make the letter pretty. If your letter is coming pretty any case, then you can follow any order of strokes. Don't worry about that. Now, if you're comfortable with this, but you've not finished the alphabet, leave some space and we'll move on to the uh, running hand. So all running letters, or which are sometimes also called cursive, Things move pretty much the way that we write these letters, but there are a few differences. In these, the strokes are not so static. So you have to develop comfort in a flow. All letters will have, many letters will have an entry stroke, the letter itself, and an exit stroke. And these are what make the letters look pretty. So if you're not familiar with cursive writing, which I think 90% of our youth population will be now, this is how you have to go about it. You have an entry, letter, exit. Then letter, exit. And all of these are written either at a slant or upright. Most of them are based on a circular form. So you might have to go back and forth to make the strokes. Like you make this stroke for G, the oval. Then you come and make the descender. But you don't finish it off because you can make a better descender coming from the other side. Usually the sides will be thick, tops and bottoms will be thin where the brush turns. That's just how the brush works. Diti, I have to leave now for office. And okay. I'll catch up on the recording. Yeah? yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Now, one way of writing an M is like this, but you can also modify it and write it as simple as that. So you don't have a line that goes over. It just comes like this. Your exit stroke of the M or the previous letter just goes and touches the top of the uh, N.
one thing to remember in cursive is that um, the spacing between the letters should be balanced. So when you're moving from writing in print to cursive, very often this space is very confusing. How much space you should leave? It is about, you can leave about the size of an oval shape between the letters or less, but not less than half because it becomes too, uh, it becomes very crowded. So suppose we mix these two letters and we write the word tossed salad. My technique is to first write the word salad because it is going to be below. And then on top of that, we can write tossed. But that's it's something that whatever you may be comfortable with, you can do. So here I'm going to try a technique where I'm writing salad with uh, with a slightly watery paint. And I'm deliberately pressing the letters in some places and some places I'm not. So where I, wherever I press press the brush, the, there will be a little less paint, which seems very uh, ironic. You feel that the more you press, like in color pencils, the more pigment will be deposited. But what actually happens is when you press a paintbrush, it squeezes the pigment onto the top surface of the brush and very little is in contact with the surface of the paper. So that which is in contact with the surface of the paper because of pressure is quickly absorbed by the fibers and the remaining does not get time to settle before you move the brush away. So you get light shades. Now always remember you need to wait before proceeding. So while this is happening, I am going to write something like sandwich with this. So going back a little bit to when we were when we written some of this text, you can always create um, base lines so that you can write the letters right on top of the base lines. I'm going to make it like this at the top. And here I'm going to use some of these capitals that slightly slanted. Right sandwich. And see, I'm keeping it very simple. I'm not making the uh, stroke go over. When I'm writing which, I need to remember that it ends with an, with an H. So I can't write so close that my H is going to stand out too much. Or it's going to clash. I can actually make it stand out. So when it comes to lettering, if you can remember to 
see the letters as shapes rather than letters or words, then you will start thinking about how much space I'm going to use up. Should I be um, leaving space here or there or what I can do? Now, some easy effects for this while these are drying. Use the glue that we used over here. And on one side of all the letters, you can make just an additional line. All you need to do is remember which side you're making the lines of every stroke and you should be fine. Whether you see the letters upright or upside down on the right of every red line, just do it automatically like artificial intelligence. Now, I forgot to keep space for an eye over here, but I'll find a way. Now do this, I could easily add another word. Now because sandwich is so big, I should not eat into the beauty of the word sandwich. So I'm going to write the next word. Smaller, just above the word sandwich. Well, Bombay sandwich is drying. I'll show you one effect for salad. This time, I'm going to change the color and use a little cobalt blue. And I, I won't turn this on. I'm going to make the same kind of strokes that I made before in half the letter forms. And they don't have to be identical. If you get them as identical strokes, that's great. But even if there are a few overlaps or a few um, places where the strokes are not identically sitting on top of the other, it's fine. And of course, if you feel the need to always write the words in pencil first. But when you're writing this in pencil, remember that you have to spread out the letters.
You can do things like these now, make an outline to the whole text. And then you can give this a shadow. Since there's so much blue we're using, I'll give a shadow to this in gray. And I'm just going to try making a shadow all around this time. Could also do this. Okay, any questions? Uh, can I show mine? Yes, let's see. Ah, so Rida, give yourself more space when you're doing this. Yeah, yeah, you could have, yeah, you could have taken a different page. Mm. Never mind, but oh, any feedback? Are you finding it easy? What's uh, is it tough? Uh, no, actually, I found also very easy. Good, okay. oh. okay, one second. Huh? Yeah, I think you're looking good. So that S that you've made in cursive, now keep it simple. Don't make a loop there. Don't make a loop which has a hole, Ritika. Because the stroke is very thick and weird, when you make a hole, it just adds volume. You don't need that. And for the, uh, I always get confused with this, uh, you know, shadow part, basically. Uh, where should I put the gray, uh, you know? Is it you, have to, you have to choose any two edges, left and bottom, right and top. So horizontal edges do hote hain, vertical edges do hote hain. So you choose e either left, uh, left and top or left and bottom, right and top or right and bottom. And then you just stay consistent with that. So for letters, mostly it's the left or right side that you see. Top, bottom, you don't even see much. But once you make all of those left or right side, then you will start seeing whether there is any need to extend it further below or extend it upper.
Okay, I could not stay without uh, marking, dotting my I. So I've gone and made it in the, in that little armpit of the end. Okay. So uh, now that we have, yeah, let's see my news. Okay, good. Looking nice. So now do you think you'll be able to plan and make recipes a little better? Whatever you do this week, though, that would still be version one or rough work. And then you still have another week to make it in fair. Okay. All right. So you don't have to use all of these. Just one or two things is fine. I know it's all very exciting. But if you feel that you want to make a backdrop also and frame also and fancy lettering also, illustrate five recipes. And Usme say, submit the one that you are happy with the most. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice, uh, Susan. Okay, so next week, then we will take a proper recipe and illustrate that. So it will be like one uh, practice. Okay. If the Can you just yeah. send the pictures of the three pages today? Yeah. I'll send it. Without the rewatch, I can just complete leftovers. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll send it right to okay. All right. I'll see you next week then. Bye. Bye, man. Thank you. Bye.